There is one word in the discussion of Bible prophecy that causes a lot of confusion and oftentimes a whole lot of debate. That word is rapture. And make no mistake, the Bible is very clear on the subject. So let's get into it. All right, folks, it's that time of the week again, and I love doing this on my channel. We are getting into yet another Bible study that is based in Bible prophecy, and I know that this particular subject is so controversial on so many levels for so many reasons, and I can understand why, but I have to say this, the Bible is so clear on the subject, and I can tell you this right now. When we talk about the subject of the rapture, this will not be the only Bible study that we do that actually discusses this topic, but undoubtedly, I hope this to be the first of many as I begin to prayerfully bring some clarity regarding this subject to you guys so that you can better understand what the scriptures teach concerning it and all the things related to it. By the way, I know that there are a lot of people that say that the word rapture isn't in the Bible. We'll get into that in just a second. There's even people that will go so far as to say that the idea or the thought or the heresy of the rapture, that's what they call it sometimes, was never taught by the early church fathers. Well, of course, I disagree because we're going to get into a study right now where the Apostle Paul is teaching on the subject of the rapture. And I also will say that there are a lot of questions that are asked because of, number one, the ambiguity that oftentimes comes with the type of teaching that's been put into this subject. And sometimes, quite frankly, there's just a lot of laziness that centers around the teaching of this subject. So what I thought I would do is I would get into perhaps one of the most foundational passages that deals with the subject of the rapture, which would be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to actually start at verse 13. We're going to get into some context here. We're going to sort of get into a description of everything that sort of centers around this very topic, how we got to this topic, where we're leading with it. And um, I think it's going to be really, really cool because I think there will be some facts about this passage that many of you have already heard, which is good, but some of you may have not. And I'm looking forward to giving you the best and most direct context for the passage that we're going over, and hopefully it will shed some light on the subject of the rapture. Now, this is the thing that's really cool. Um, when we talk about this subject, at least from the perspective of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there are so many other issues that get touched, and if you don't touch those issues, you're not going to understand the very subject of the rapture that so many people are trying to actually figure out and understand. A lot of people want to get right to the point, but the reality of it is the point centers around understanding the immediate and uh, the not-so-immediate context. So there's a lot of stuff here that we want to go over. Now, first and foremost, let me just make myself clear. The word rapture, believe it or not, is in the Bible. You will find it in a Latin translation of the Bible. I want to make myself very, very clear because there is a section that we are going to read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where it talks about a phrase that we use called caught up. That's what you'll read in the King James that word caught up is actually translated in the Greek harpazo, which means a violent snatching. And that very Greek word harpazo is directly translated in the Latin rapturus, which is where we get the word rapture from. So when we say uh, the rapture, it is a biblical term. It happens to come from the Latin translation of the Greek word harpazo, which in essence means the same thing, a violent snatching. In other words, the idea is it's sudden, it's quick, it's significant, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. So before we do this, we have to talk about the context here. Paul is speaking to the Thessalonian church. As he's writing this letter, I believe it's a very similar type of a context as the letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth. He is addressing some questions that have come up. He's addressing some matters uh, that were brought to his attention. He's addressing some things that maybe they didn't ask him about, but he wants to continue to bring clarity to because of the false teachers that were sort of floating around in that moment. And he's going out of his way to make sure people understand the context of which all of these concerns came from. So he's uh, he goes out of his way to talk about some really, really, really critical things. And all of these things relate to really important subjects. 
like salvation, your identity in Christ, and many other things. So Paul is going down a list where he's talking about all this stuff, and this stuff is really, really, really important. Like, for example, at the very beginning of the chapter in verse 1, he says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God so you would abound more and more. In other words, you guys have been instructed. We came, we discipled you. We want to show you what you need to do in order to walk as you have been asked to walk. You have been given uh, uh, instruction. You've been given wisdom. We've discipled you. We've taught you how to live your life, walking according to the things of God. And look what he says in verse two. He says, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Because there are some elements of this phrase alone that require a little bit of focus. So what do I mean when I say focus? There are some very subtle details in this verse that could easily be missed if you're not paying attention to the way some of these words are very intentionally connected. Now, there's one thing I have to say. When the Apostle Paul writes, he writes with significant intention. You see this on full display all throughout his letters, especially in the letter that he writes to the Hebrew church, but you see it everywhere. And certainly in the Thessalonian church letter, make no mistake about it, it is very clear that he is expressing deep intent in the things that he is writing. Let me give you an example of what I mean when I say this. I want you to focus on a few words in verse two. He says, for you know. So he isn't like making a statement that says, I hope you know, or you should know. He says, no, you know, you are aware. I have made you aware of these things for, you know, what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So he's making several statements here. And I want you to pay attention to this. He's telling the church, the Thessalonian church, first of all, you know this already. This isn't something that you are ignorant of. You also know the instruction or the commandments that we gave you. In other words, these are not subjective. These are very objective. They are imperative in nature, right? He's saying, you know the very commands that we gave you by the authority of Christ. So he says, you know what commands have been given to you? They've been given to you by us, and they've been given to you by the authority of of Christ Jesus. So the idea that's really, really important to grasp is that Paul is off the bat coming to them on a different authority than his own. He's basically coming to them saying, this is the Lord. The Lord has asked you to do these things. I'm as a messenger that told you these things. And look at the reason. Look what he says. He says, for this is the will of God. Notice this, even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. So clearly there are some problems that they're going through in the Thessalonian church. There's fornication. There's a struggle there. There's um, uh, uh, some questions with respect to maintaining a certain sanctity of the things that God has made holy. And so he talks about this. I'll give you another example. Look at verse four. He says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Let's read verse five. It says this, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. By the way, concupiscence, say that five times, is an interesting word, very much aligned with Elizabethan King uh, James English. It means sexual desire. It means lust, okay? So they were giving themselves to the lust and the desire of their flesh, and it was driving them in a very, very dark direction, right? So he addresses that, you know, the issue of sexual desire in verse six. He talks about defrauding your brother. He talks about the idea idea that God has not called us to live uncleanly lives, uh, obviously referring to the fact that we are, uh, that they were being unholy and they needed to walk in holiness. He uh, wanted to talk about the idea of uh, embracing what the spirit of God says to you and learning how to love one another. He gets into all of these things. And then he even goes so far as to say, listen, live a quiet life, be a person who uh, works with your hands so that nobody has to support you and uh, that you would not have any lack of anything, right? You have lack of nothing. So he talks about all these things, very, very important. And then he gets onto a subject that I believe 
is super critical. And he starts with verse 13. And these verses are read all the time, but oftentimes not understood. And this is where we get into the subject of the rapture because this, boy, let me tell you something. This is some significant stuff. Look what he says here, verse 13. He says, but... I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Okay, let's break this down, because this is important. Verse 13, when he talks about he does not want us to be ignorant, look, this is powerful. The Bible is designed so that we would not be ignorant. Ignorant is a very, very ugly word in that when people are given to ignorance, they allow themselves to be put in a position where their lack of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding keeps them from being able to experience everything that God has for them and everything that God wants to bring them to. And folks, I wanna say this. When you choose to be ignorant regarding the subject of something as significant as the rapture or insignificant as some people might, say, you allow certain doctrines or ways of thinking to develop in your mind, which can stunt your spiritual growth. And not only just stunt your spiritual growth, but what can it, what it can actually do is allow you to take your focus off of things that are critical to be focused on so that you can accomplish and finish the mission that God has put in front of you. Can I give you an example of this? When I was much younger in the Lord, I remember thinking in my mind, well, I don't really care if I take on a lot of debt. Uh, Of course, my dad never let me do that. Thank God for my father, right? But my mindset was, I don't care if I take on a lot of debt. I don't care what I do in this immediate moment because I know that Jesus is going to come back probably before I graduate Bible college. That was the way of thinking. And then, of course, after I graduated Bible college, I said, I don't even know why I should mess around with doing this or doing that because, well, I'm going to I'm going to get raptured before I get married. Right. And there's this mindset that exists where we're so excited about the rapture because the rapture could happen at any moment. And that's true. Listen, understand this. Christ could rapture his church at any moment, but when you don't understand the doctrine the way it was intended to be used and understood, then it stunts your ability to be able to do what God has called you to do. Can I give you an example of this? God has placed a call upon my life to do a tremendous work that people would not only be able to hear the gospel, but that their lives would be enriched through the preaching and teaching of his word, and that they would be guided by the things that God's word has to offer. And God's given me a very specific gift to be able to communicate those things. But if I develop the mentality that says, why should I waste my time preparing for the future? Or why should I waste my time preparing for this or preparing for that? I, in essence, cut myself short from doing the things that I know God has called me to do because my lack of preparation and my lack of understanding of the things that could happen in the near future actually has now stunted me from being able to do things when I get to that point, okay? And a perfect example of this is at a very, very young age, If you are a person who is focused on supporting the family that you know God will bring you and being able to be financially responsible because you know there will be a rainy day in the future and you're not thinking in your mind, well, we're going to be raptured anyway, so why should I save money or why should I invest money? Well, then time might actually go by. And if the Lord tarries and he doesn't rapture his church in the immediate moment that you find yourself You'll have enough money to be financially independent. You'll be able to go and do the things that God is calling you to do. You will not be bound by the things that oftentimes bind people because they didn't prepare or go out of their way to do the things that were necessary in order to cause them to be effective in whatever God called them to be. So the idea that the Apostle Paul says, I would not have you be uh, ignorant is such an important aspect of his communication to us the very important aspect of our very learning. Because the more we go out of our way to remove the element of ignorance, and the more we make ourselves acclimated to the truth, and the more we begin to prepare ourselves for what we know will be coming in the near future, the better equipped we are to do the work that God has actually called us to do. And I think it's so important 
to think through those things. We have to think about the future. We have to think about the call that God has placed upon our lives. And this is really, really important when it comes to knowing the scriptures. Because if you know what to expect and you're not ignorant of the things to expect, then you'll also find comfort and peace in knowing what to prepare for as time goes on. And I love what he says here because he says this. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. What this means here, without getting into to all the technical mumbo jumbo is it means I don't want you to be ignorant about those who have died. And what he's talking about here, because we know as we get more into the immediate context, it's going to broaden our understanding of who he's referring to. He's talking about those people who have died as Christians. Okay. So this is important. He doesn't want us to be ignorant about people who have passed away, who were walking with God because our ignorance of people passing away or what happens to them when they pass away could very much change the way we live our lives from day to day. So this is why he says this. He says, look, I want you to know what's going on. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those that are dead. Why? Because I don't want you to sorrow. He says that you sorrow not. In other words, I don't want you to mourn like the rest of the world mourns. Here's the thing. When the rest of the world mourns, they mourn because they have no hope. They mourn because they know when a loved one dies, they're never going to see their loved one again. That their loved one is, it's its a wrap, it's done. They're not gonna be seen. There is no contact, there is no uh, relationship, there's nothing, it's all gone. But for those of us that are believers, we have a much greater hope. We have a hope that is unparalleled and unmatched to anything else because when somebody dies that's close to us, that's walking with the Lord, we know that we're going to see them again. When my mom went to go be with the Lord, when my dad went to go be with the Lord, my pastor, many people that have been close to me over the years, when they went to go be with the Lord, my hope has always been founded in two very important things. Number one, the people that have died are where they've always wanted to be because it is the reward for the life lived on this earth, Christ's life that was lived on this earth, but their faith and trust in Christ for that reward. They're in heaven. They wouldn't want to come back here, even if they uh, were given an opportunity to. There's no way they would want to come back here. So it gives us comfort in knowing that there's no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more hardship, no more difficulty, no more burdens, no more trials, no more crime, no more ugliness, no more you know wickedness. They literally have been absolved of all of that because they are with the creator of the universe in heaven, having already heard the words, well done, good and faithful servant. So that's the first thing it does for us. The second thing that it does for us is it gives us hope because we know not only are they well taken care of, but we also know that one day we'll be reunited with them. I always used to think about this without getting emotional. It's kind of hard to not get emotional when I think about this, but as my mom was living in her last days, um, she had to be under the care of a whole group of people. And every single time she would be away under their care or um, she wasn't with us, there was this great concern in our hearts, like, man, are they taking good care of her? Are they doing the things that they need to be doing to, to love on her and to minister to her? And, you know, are they, you know, is she, is she uh, being treated with respect and dignity? And, you know, you, during that time, even during my work days, it was really, really hard to, to get my head away from wondering what's going on with my mom. But when she went to go be with the Lord, it's hard not to get emotional, but she's in <laughs> there's no more worry about that. She's being taken care of by the Lord. She's in the best place that she'll ever be. And I have nothing to worry about. And one day I'm gonna be with her. So so think about this. We don't have to mourn like the world does. We don't, we're not the, we don't, we have tons of hope when people close to us die because we know where they are. Look what it says in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and listen, I don't know about you, but I believe that Jesus died and rose again. I think all of us believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus 
will God bring with him. So if you ever wonder, by the way, what he means when he says, those which are asleep, now this immediate context in verse 14 sheds light on who he's talking about. He's talking about those who sleep in Jesus. So he says, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, notice this, will God bring with him. So we can gather that there was a concern amongst the church, the Thessalonian church, because they were the ones that the Apostle Paul spend a lot of time talking to about end times and about the rapture and lots of details related to that. There clearly was a question that was being voiced to the Apostle Paul or a concern that he caught wind of that the Thessalonian church had that basically said, hey, the rapture is going to happen any day, but there are people that are dying left and right that are close to us. What happens with them in the rapture? Do they get left behind? Like what takes place? So the Apostle Paul says, no, 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 no. Look, we have hope when they die because in essence, we know where they are, right? And we don't have to sorrow because we know what's going on. We have the hope. But look what he says. He says, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, then you also have to understand that those people that are dead in Christ, those people who have passed away prior to the time of the rapture, God's going to bring with him. <laughs> Think about that. In other words, what he's saying is they're not going to miss out. Now, this verse opened up my, my mind and my heart to a whole lot of things because it's funny. If I always used to be scared of the subject of the rapture. Like people, you know, you hear the, the song, you've been left behind, you know, the old uh, Thief in the Night movie. It used to scare the living snot out of me. And as I started really walking with the Lord and I began to develop a better understanding of the scriptures and the ignorance that I had was no longer there, I actually started getting really excited about the rapture. Let me explain why. Okay, first of all, if I were to die today, God forbid, of some you know medical reason or something like that, I'm not going to miss out on the rapture because to, to uh, live as Christ, uh, to die is gain. We know that. And what gain do we have? Well, to be absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. So we gain heaven. We die, we gain heaven. There's something pretty spectacular in understanding that. So we know that there's no loss. And we also know that when we go to be with the Lord, let's just, you know, like my mom, for example, or dad who went to go be with the Lord, they are going to be part of this grand event that the Apostle Paul is about to describe for us. So you, you the thing is, is you're not going to miss out. But this is what always got me excited about the rapture. See, here's the thing. I've never really been afraid of death. I, honestly, I, I, death is not anything that's really scared me. But the only thing, and I have to admit this, the only thing that has kind of scared me a little bit is how I'm going to die. <laughs> you get what I mean? I mean, look, I, I would, I, it, it, for me, there'd be two ways that I would like to die if I die. I would like to die like in a blaze of glory where I'm just in the midst of, of fighting and I'm in that fight one moment and the next moment, boom, I'm in heaven right? That would be awesome. Like just in a blaze of glory, you know, where you just don't feel it. It's sudden and you're rocking and rolling. It was like, you're, you're in the thick of it. And then boom, you're, 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 you're there, right? That would be awesome, right? The other way that I wouldn't mind would probably be like my grandfather did, who was serving the Lord. He was literally at a ministry, uh, gathering that he was doing literally in Egypt and that night he went to bed and he woke up in the presence of the Lord. That'd be kind of cool, right? Very peaceful. Uh, you wouldn't feel anything. You wouldn't know anything. He just say good night to everybody. And then all of a sudden, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, awesome. This is why the rapture is so cool. The rapture is so cool because you ain't going to die. You will enter into the state of eternity through a completely different process. It's pretty cool. I mean, to, to experience what that's like to be taken up in the clouds. And I mean, that's got to be the ultimate. And I know that there's uh, one person who knows what that feels like. You know, uh, Elijah, I guess we can, we, we can talk about that. But the funny thing about this is, and maybe some people argue Enoch, but the thing is to, 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 to stop for a moment to consider God just taking us up in a blaze of glory. I mean, what a powerful picture. So the rapture isn't scary to us that walk with the Lord because it means we've just bypassed physical death. That's incredible, right? But for those who have physically died, the apostle Paul saying he's going to bring us, he's going to bring them back. Look at this. 
Verse 15, for we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And again, this is the authority of God. This isn't my word. He says, this is God's word. He says, for we say unto you by the word of the Lord, this is verse 15, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, the the the, the picture that this draws for us is that we're not going to be in a situation where those that are dead in Christ are going to miss out, okay? We're, we're not going to be in a different class. These are people who are part of the church that they, they passed away prior to the rapture. They are going to be part of the festivities. So in case that was unclear to the people that are reading, what does he do? He describes to us what's going to happen. So it wasn't just enough for him to say that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent uh, them which are asleep. When we talk about them not preventing those that are asleep, okay, let me read that that last phrase because I, I forgot to say this. I'm so excited about what I'm about to read that I forgot to tell you this part. So let me read verse 15 again. It says, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, here's the phrase, shall not prevent them which are asleep. So I forgot to say this, okay? Um, when it says shall not prevent them, it means we're not gonna go before them. Uh, meaning they're not missing out on anything, okay? And I, I, that's, I, I, I wanted to stop and just explain that word to you. Prevent here in Elizabethan King James had a slightly different meaning. It basically means that we're not gonna go before them. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying they're not only going to not miss out, but something's gonna happen to them first. So that's really good. I want you to understand that as we jump into the description of actually what happens at the rapture. Look what it says in verse 16. For the Lord himself, watch this folks, this is so cool. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Notice this, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay, let me just tell you what this is not. First of all, I heard a person write a whole book on how Donald Trump was going to be the person that brings in the rapture because of this phrase, with the trump of God. Okay, that's ridiculous. This was not written in the English language. It was written in the Hebrew or the Greek language. And of course, this phrase Trump has nothing to do with the name Trump. Okay, it's really important to understand that. We know that there will be a shouting voice. We know that that voice will proclaim the commencement of this process of the rapture. And we also know that it will be spectacular. Okay, because the trumpet of God is going to end up sounding. Now, this is what happens right before the rapture takes place. Notice what they say happens first. Okay, we should pay attention to this. When you take this literally, it helps you to better be able to understand what happens. If you're looking for timelines, this is about as close to a timeline as I can give you. Okay, and then I'll explain the timeline issue in just a second. But look what it says. Okay. It says this, it says, for the Lord himself, what? He descends from heaven with a shout. So we see the Lord descending from heaven. By the way, this is not to be conflated with the second coming. It's a completely different moment. The Matthew 24, it's a completely different moment. This is prior to the tribulation, okay? It says, for the Lord himself shall what? Descend from heaven with a shout. Notice this, with the voice of the archangel. So the Lord is gonna descend. There's going to be a shout, uh, the voice of the archangel, right? And then watch this, and a trumpet will be sounding. Now, my guess is they are all simultaneously happening. I think these are the things that are happening somewhat simultaneously. I think uh, that the Lord descending from heaven with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, I believe those are all happening at the same time. So the picture here is Christ is descending from heaven. He's coming in the clouds. We know that from other passages, right? He's descending from heaven. As he's descending from heaven, then there are two other things that are happening as he is descending from heaven. Notice this. There's a shout, the voice of the archangel. So he's coming down with the shout. Uh, there is the voice of the archangel. There's three things, actually, if you really if you really want to break it up. He's coming down. It's with a shout. There's a voice of the archangel that's being sounded. And then what happens? Watch this. Then a trump of God. Okay, so there's a trumpet sound, there's a voice of the archangel, there's a shout. Now, some people will argue that the shout is the voice of the archangel. 
I don't know. I know enough to simply know that these are three elements that we see given to us very, very clearly. And then watch what happens next, okay? So I believe all of those items are happening simultaneously. This is based on what I believe the text is showing us. And then it says this, this happens next. This is the next thing that happens. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, there's a lot of speculation as into what this means. Some people say, well, if, if you're absent from the body and you're present with the Lord, then what does it mean that you're dead in Christ and you're going to rise first? Well, I happen to believe that this is a timeline issue. I believe that this is when, when you die, you, in essence, enter into a realm that is outside of time. OK, you are in a place that is outside of the elements that God created in the sense that you're no longer bound by time. So it's very possible that the very moment my mom resurrects from the dead will feel like the very moment that she actually died. And the very moment I get raptured to my mom, it will feel like the very moment that she passed away from the Lord. That's what I think is happening now. The, the, this is very difficult to explain, and there are some different ideas as in what's happening, but we do know that there is an order here, and that order is those that have died in Christ are going to rise first. Then notice this, what it says in verse 17. It says, then we which are alive and remain. In other words, those of us that are alive and we're here on this earth, look what happens, shall be caught up. That word, by the way, harpazo, snatched, okay, raptured. That word rapturus, that's the word that comes from that Greek word harpazo. So it says, if you were going to read this in the Latin, it would say, then we, then we which are alive and remain shall be raptured up together. That's in essence what it's saying. So we're going to get caught up together with them in the clouds. Okay, now this is interesting because we know that the Lord will be coming in the clouds. We actually read about this in the book of Acts when there, there's a promise that was made to us there. But even more importantly, look at the immediate context. The immediate context says, we that are remain shall be caught up together. Uh, we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Who's them? It's Christ and those that died in Christ that have resurrected. So we're going to join them in the clouds. Christ and those who actually resurrected that were uh, all previously dead in Christ. So we're going to join them in the clouds. Notice this, to meet the Lord in the air. I love it. So we're going to have this grand incredible meeting with the God of heaven. And look what it says, folks. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the beginning of eternity for us. Remember when I told you that I love the rapture, the idea of the rapture so much, or the truth of the rapture, the inevitability of the rapture so much, because my way of entering into eternity becomes the most ideal way in human history to be taken up. <laughs> Could you imagine? I mean, I, I really hope that happens. I would actually love to be raptured while I'm teaching a Bible study in church or to be raptured while maybe I'm making a YouTube video or even be raptured while I'm doing something that glorifies the Lord. I mean, it would be incredible, especially if my family was with me. Looking at my children, oh, it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be such a blessing. So we're going to be taken up with the Lord. We're going to meet him in the air and so shall we be ever uh, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Look at the last command that he gives us in verse 18. And by the way, we're going to do a separate study that's dedicated to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 because we're going to deal with the subject of the thief in the night. That'll come up uh, I probably say in a few months from now. But look at this verse 18. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Isn't it amazing how the words concerning the rapture of the church have become words that are used to spark debate. They've become words that are used to sensationalize things that should have never been sensationalized. They are words that are used to produce income. They are words that are used to do everything except comfort one another. Sometimes when people talk about the rapture, they talk about it in context of, you're going to be left behind because you're not walking with the Lord. And yeah, if you're not, if you're not, if you don't follow Christ, yeah, you're going to be left behind and what awaits for you is ugly. But the knowledge of what happens in the rapture was given to us by the Lord. The apostle Paul says it right here so that we might comfort one another. Now, I want to say something that's probably going to bother a few people. I don't want you to be bothered. I want you to please listen to me and take it to heart. And please, 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 I'm begging you. I am begging you. 
please, whatever you do, put this into practice. I see a lot of really incredible people that watch us online. I mean, we have, I'm telling you, we have some of the greatest community of people that watch us online. You people are amazing. I, I, I'm just so thankful to the Lord for the honor and the joy and the privilege that I have to be able to minister to you guys because you guys are some of the most extraordinary human beings alive. But I see a lot of this in the chats. I'm tired of this life. I want to go home. I want to be raptured. Okay. Amen. I'll give it to you. I'm tired of the ugliness of this world. I'm tired of the darkness that I continue to face from day to day. Look, I'm with you. Listen to me. Listen to me good. I agree 100% with being tired of it all. But I want you to understand something. The joy that God wants us to have leading to this point is what's going to make the rapture so especially extraordinary. I want to challenge you with something. I don't think that God wants you to be raptured in a state of disillusionment. I don't think that God wants you to be raptured with the mindset that just simply says, I've been waiting. Enough is enough. I hate these people. This is terrible. I hate this world. I can't wait. I've been wanting to exit for a long time. I don't think God wants us to think that way. I don't even think God wants us to exit this world with the mindset that says, I long to exit this world because I hate this world. I think every single Christian alive who's walking with God and knows his word should be the type of person who longs to leave this world because they want to be with their creator. Not because they hate the world so much. Look, I don't know about you, but as dark as the world is getting, I love the privilege and the honor that I have of living in this world to be able to have a voice and make a difference. I am not in a rush to leave this world because I hate this world. I know that one day I will have a sweet reunion with the love, the people that I've loved for so long, and I can't wait for that. I cannot wait to meet my maker and to thank him for all he's done for me, especially considering the fact that I'm a dirty, rotten scoundrel. But I can tell you this, I don't believe God wants us to desire to leave this world because we hate the wickedness that we're seeing around us. I believe that God wants us to be the type of people that will think of the prospect of us leaving this world, especially in the context of the rapture, with hope. When I talk about hope, this is what I mean, guys, and I want you to think about this. When a person has hope, they can live in the worst of circumstances and make those circumstances spectacular. Joseph is a great example of this. You look at the life that Joseph lived, every part of his, the majority of his life was miserable, but he had hope. And that hope drove him to continue to seek God's face to do the things that God had wanted him to do. And he saved a whole generation as a result. The encouragement that I would give to you is this. Allow your knowledge of what happens after death to be the source of hope that drives you to live a life that is fulfilled on this world. Allow your desire and knowledge of the rapture being imminent to give you the type of hope within your life that you beam to other people. That when people look at you, they, they see an it factor. That they look at you and they go, oh my goodness, there's something about that person that just makes me happy to be alive. I want to build a community of people that watch this channel and a community of people that fellowship at Calvary Chapel Signal Hill and a community of people that are with me, serving the Lord and recipients of the gift that God has given me to teach the word. I want all of you guys, every last one of you, to experience the kind of hope 
and use that hope that will change the lives of everybody around you so that when you leave this world, it even, it kind of feels bittersweet. Bitter in the sense that you've had so much work to do and you've ran out of time. Sweet in that, you know where you're going. Let's get rid of the fatalistic way of thinking, folks. It's driving so much of what we're seeing in the prophecy world. And let's begin to develop the type of hope that causes us to live lives of renewal. That the word of God would burn so within our hearts that we are making a difference everywhere. We're showing up in school board meetings. We're getting involved in the political arena, bringing the hope of Jesus. We are talking about the things that matter. We're standing up for kids that are being exploited. We're doing the work of God and we're doing it with a certain joy because we know what is set before us. That's what the rapture is all about. Join me in this, folks. There's nothing like living a life in anticipation of the imminent return of Christ, in anticipation of the rapture, understanding and knowing that it drives the hope and causes me to live the way that I live every day. I love living on this earth. I, there's nothing about this earth that I like in terms of righteousness but I love living on this earth because it's a reflection of an honor and a joy that God has given me to serve him and accomplish a mission. And I'm trying to do my best to practice what I need to practice to be ready for the ultimate mission that awaits for me in heaven, the one I know nothing about because God is good. Let the rapture be one of the things that cause your comfort and hope to be built that you might look at these things and recognize the future that God has waiting for you. Let's do it, folks. Christ will come at any moment. Comfort one another with these words. God bless you.